Gresham College presents Is the growth in the emerging economies additional or are we growing more slowly? By Professor Douglas McWilliams. Um, tonight we're looking at the constraints on world economic growth from the shortage of primary resources. Although I've got a reasonable amount of experience at, uh, looking at the outlook for demand, I'm not an expert on supplies of natural resources. So I've therefore invited two people who do know a lot about these things. Thras Moritis is a member of the executive board of Extrata, the global commodities business, it's in the news a certain amount at the moment. And Michael McWilliams, who is my brother, in case you want to know, is the global head of hydropower for the engineering consultants, Mott McDonald. I'm very grateful indeed to both of them for joining us this evening. Welcome, Thras and Mike. What we concluded in the first lecture last month was that the second great transformation, the industrialization, excuse me, of two-thirds two -thirds of the world's population was indeed the greatest ever world economic change. The scale of the shift in advantage was remarkable, but even more so the speed. Essentially, essentially China is achieving in 50 years what it took us in the UK and in most of the West more than 150 years to achieve. One of the consequences of this has been that attitudes in the emerging Eastern economies have adjusted more slowly than they might have done had the pace of economic transformation been slower. As a result, the emerging economies have become super competitive because they have not allowed their emerging prosperity to dull their economic edge. What we're now turning to is the global envelope of total economic growth within which these changes in the balance of advantage are taking place. The underlying analysis is that the limits to economic growth are likely to be essentially economic with the consequences of shortages of natural resources or environmental difficulties incorporated into the relationship between the supply of primary products and the demand for them. The thesis, therefore, is that there is a shortage of, say, energy, that this will limit the pace at which the world economy can grow because excess growth would lead to too fast a rise in the price of energy, which would add to world inflation and squeeze living standards and create disinflationary policies that in turn would slow down growth. We're already seeing signs of this in China at the moment. What we're therefore doing today is looking at the various different constraints on world economic growth to see to what extent they will hold back the total of world economic growth. And to the extent that world growth is constrained, it is likely that with the East in a super competitive state, economic growth in the Western economies will be constrained quite a lot more. When we've considered the extent to which growth is limited, we will look at some policy measures that might alleviate these constraints. In addition to the shortages of primary commodities, there are two other factors which we can consider that might hold back world economic growth. The first of these is essentially economic, that the disruptive effect of the extent of the change that is taking place will on, damage, will on balance damage growth. And the second, of course, is the environment. Many have claimed that there are environmental limits to growth, and we will see how this feeds in. We will look at these in turn, and then at four areas of primary product supply, where there might also be shortage of supplies that might probably through the price mechanism that I've already outlined, cause the pace of economic growth to be limited. That's food, minerals, energy, and water. Again, we will look at these in turn. Thras will cover minerals, Mike will cover energy and water. They will both ask if there are technologies that can change the impact of these constraints. We will then look at whether, if growth constrained, what are the implications for the emerging economies and for the Western economies. And finally, we'll look at the policy measures uh, what policy measures will allow faster growth by limiting the shortages that might hold growth back. Let me start with economic uncertainty. It would be naive 
to imagine that the major shift in world economic leadership will automatically proceed smoothly. In the past, economic growth has been disrupted by wars, and indeed the change in world economic leadership uh, from uh, the United uh, Kingdom to the United States also proved disruptive. And you could argue to some extent that the economic problems of the 1930s have been caused by that. In this case, I have argued, and subsequently my arguments have been picked up and given a degree of prominence by people like Charles Dumas from Lombard Street Research and Sir Samuel Britton from the Financial Times, that one of the effects of the shifting world economic leadership for the West and the East has been to create a surplus of savings in the world as world GDP has increasingly emerged in countries that have a high savings ratio like China, which of course has been enhanced by their policy of managing their exchange rates, and diminishingly in countries like the United States with a low savings ratio. In China, if you give them a pound, they spend 50p. In the US, if you give them a pound, they spend 95p. And the shift in relative prosperity from one to the other makes quite a lot of difference. The consequent excess of savings has held down world interest rates. Now, on its own, this would not be a problem. But many investors, for example, pension funds in the West, have had unrealistic expectations of what nominal interest rates should be, and indeed have been partially encouraged in these by the regulatory authorities based on the actuarial extrapolation of history. I have to say that in my view, actuaries are weapons of mass financial destruction. <laughs> to achieve these nominal returns in a world with a saving surplus, they've taken on excess risk. Let's face it, in retrospect, the idea of buying bonds which are backed by mortgages handed out to subprime borrowers, and subprime merely means they're unlikely to be able to repay, and where the main basis of keeping the loans alive is rolling them up with the increase in property values to cover non-existent interest payments doesn't look in the cold light of day to be a great business proposition. I had a, an exchange of letters with Sir Howard Davis, the then head of the FSA, about reducing the appropriate target return for pension fund investments. And he preferred, I'm afraid, to go with the actuarial extrapolation of past trends. As a trustee and a member of the investment committee of the GEC pension fund, I managed to stop them buying such bonds, even though the trade union representatives were quite encouraged by the idea. Uh, but the fact that the bond salesman had found it worth his while to fly the Atlantic simply to have one meeting with us struck me as a warning in itself. It suggested he must have run out of potential fools in the US and needed to go abroad to find equivalent fools. The financial crisis that started with the collapse of the subprime bond mortgage market is still with us, five years on. And like Mervyn King, I judge that the aftermath is likely to be with us for perhaps between five and ten years, constraining growth as balance sheets are rebuilt and governments retrench. Indeed, the impact on government borrowing, which was added to by grossly over-optimistic assumptions upon which they built their spending plans, is probably likely to be with us for a generation. We're going to be paying for the cost of Gordon Brown for 20 years or more. This will constrain economic growth in the West and through its knock-on effects in the East as well. I'll deal with the links between the world financial crisis and the shift from West to East in my lectures next year. The second economic problem that's likely to constrain world economic growth is the problem of the Euro. Again, I'm going to deal with this in detail in my lectures next year, but the sub-down version is that whatever the underlying economics of the euro, trying to introduce it at a time when the West is losing competitiveness against the East, when Europe in general is losing competitiveness against the rest of the West, and when Southern Europe is losing competitiveness against Northern Europe, is, to put it mildly, difficult. We don't know how the euro problem will pan out, but as things stand, there seem to be two possible choices. 
either very slow, and I mean by that probably negative, economic growth as the uncompetitive economies try to adjust by internal devaluations, which effectively means cutting wages, or the disruption to banking systems and other institutions that result from a euro breakup and the consequent defaults that would result. My instinct that the latter would actually cost less in the long run, but we can't be certain about this. What we can be certain about is either path is likely to prove costly. And of course, when we're in uncharted economic territory, we cannot rule out other economic mistakes that will constrain economic growth as well. Let me turn now to the environment. The Stern Review states that with five to six degrees centigrade warming, which is a real possibility of the next centigrade, existing models that include the risk of abrupt and large scale climate change estimate an average five to 10% loss in global GDP with poor countries suffering costs in excess of 10% of GDP. In other parts of the review, this is subbed down to an estimated loss of GDP on an annual basis of 5%. However, the review has been heavily criticized by Peter Lilly, who argues that the stern headlines are exaggerated. For the purpose of this assessment, we do not need to take a view on the reality either of global warming or its impact, but merely on whether it is likely to lead to measures that have an impact on the cost of primary products, particularly energy. At present, the extent to which there are long-term fears of environmental damage is leading to policies designed to mitigate such damage, and that varies between different geographies. European pol policy has developed further along these lines than policy in either the US or in emerging economies like China. But it is in clear that in most areas there is an intention to incentivize the use of renewable resources by taxing non-renewables and by subsidizing the production of renewables. Whether this becomes a serious, serious constraint on growth will depend on the extent to which rapid development of non-renewables becomes probable. We will have a look at this in more detail in the section on energy. Let me turn now to food. The first of the primary products that I would like to consider is food. I've relied essentially on the FAO report, How to Feed the World in 2050. This report argues that feeding the world can be done, but at a cost. The cost is likely to be reflected in prices. We've seen this year considerable rises in food prices. The FAO's estimate is that there will need to be 209 billion US dollars of gross investment annually, it looks spuriously precise, at 2009 prices, uh, compared with an annual rate of about two thirds of that in the past decade. But the FAO has also looked at what might be a game changer, which is genetically modified food. The FAO study on this estimates, this is purely looking at the economics, that the impact where they come is to reduce the average world price of food by between 13 and 40%, though no time frame is suggested. What is clear is that the current regimes for developments of GM food are different in different areas. Most GM food so far has been grown in either the US or in Latin America. Indeed, the rapid growth of agricultural production uh, and exports based on GM technology has been an important factor in Brazil's growth to become the world's sixth largest economy. If European economies, which have had varying approaches to the application of GM technologies, but which have been largely restrictive on the whole, continue to shoe them, not only will they face competitive challenges from the emerging economies from the cost side, but also from the technological side. So it is likely that there will be some upward pressure on costs from food shortages, though it is possible that GM technologies can mitigate these. Of course, food production is intimately connected with the availability of water. So we'll revisit this in the section uh, looking at water supplies. Now let me hand over to you, Thras, for a section on minerals. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much, Doug, for giving me this uh, opportunity to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, and that's the uh, secular change in demand for commodities. The first thing I wanted to say is that my conviction, and I think now increasingly the conviction of others, is that we are uh, 10 years into a multi-decade secular uh, change in the fortunes of commodities. It's, uh, it's a result of the combined impact of the industrialization and urbanization uh, of two-thirds of the world's population, obviously driven initially by China. Over a billion people will move to the cities um, in the next decade. That's over a million a week uh, will be moving to cities. In China, which is now 50% urbanized compared to a 70% urbanization in uh, the other OECD countries, 300 million more people will be urbanized over the next 15 years. 
That's, a, that's the size of the US population. 220 cities will have more than a million people in them by that time, and I remind you that Europe has 35 of those cities at this point in time. And so in practice, and I use this analogy for my own purposes so that I can visualize what we are talking about here, China is building a new Australia every single year. All the roads, all the schools, all the ports, all the houses, every single year. Now, whenever I, I begin to doubt uh, the this, this secular thesis and my own conviction on that, I turn for solace to these intensity curves. Because these intensity curves show us some very well-trodden paths of other economies as they industrialized uh, over the last 120 years or so. And we can see that China and India inside that red circle have only just begun their journey. In fact, um, if China is to reach the expected GDP per capita levels by 2015, they will have to double their demand uh, intensity for the various commodities, including energy. India is just beginning uh, in the bottom left-hand corner. What's interesting about the various commodities and how they perform on that trajectory is that each of them show a very different path um, depending on which part of the economic development each of these economies is. So you have early stage commodities, which are iron ore and steel, which are driven really by the, industrialized, the infrastructure that's been developed at the beginning of an economy's development. You have then a middle stage um, uh, commodities, which are things like copper, lead, and zinc, which relate to an economy which is then moving into value-added goods and the production of, uh, of higher-valued products. And then you have late-cycle commodities, such as platinum and nickel, which are driven by domestic demand of motor vehicles and other uh, durable goods. China is, we expect at this point in time, about 60 to 70 percent up the infrastructure commodity curve, and very, very low uh, on the other two curves. And India, as I said earlier, is simply not uh, anywhere on those curves yet, but is beginning to, to show its, its strength in demand. Now, it's important to note that this is not a new phenomenon, although it is a, a different phenomenon in terms of its size, as Doug said. It's multi-decade secular trends are not unprecedented. We saw the first great one when the US industrialized at the late uh, in the late 1800s. We saw the second one when Europe industrialized and then was reconstructed after the Second World War. And we saw the third one follow almost immediately after that when Japan industrialized. And so yet again we're seeing the same secular trend. What's important here of course is that this is now an order of magnitude greater than anything we've ever seen before. Now we're in the midst of a cyclical downturn and so I often get asked the question, is the super cycle over? And as, as I think uh, my conviction will show you and I have shown you on those intensity curves, of course I don't believe that. And in our work we've shown that there are really at least two types of cycles in commodities. There are the short term five to seven year cycles which are simply su supply demand imbalances. And then there are these long secular trends which are 25 to 35 years long. Um, which have to do with these major structural shifts in technology or, or, other, um, or other factors such as the industrialization that's going on now. Now this is not just a demand side story, it's also a supply side story. The supply side was underinvested in for uh, over a decade from 1987 through to the beginning of the 2000s because uh, there was a belief that that was the end of commodities and that prices would fall in real terms forever. Uh, at about one to one and a half percent. And so the supply side was really ill-equipped to meet the demand that was starting to come from China. The supply side is suffering from dependence on these old grand mines that were developed in the traditional markets like North America and Australia and so on. Um, mines which are now getting to the end of their lives. They're old and tired. The costs are going up. The grades are falling. The grade of a mine is essentially the percentage of the of each ton that you mine, which is made up by the, the material that you're after, whether it's copper or zinc and so on. And we're seeing, for example, in copper, grades are going to fall over the next 10 years from 1.4% per ton to 1% per ton. Now, that doesn't sound like a very significant drop, but if you think about the fact that in order to just sustain our level of production where it is today, we have to double the amount of ore that we mine and the amount of ore that we mill and grind and ship. Um, you'll see the, the magnitude of the challenge for the industry just to stay where it is. So we're running very hard as an industry just to, stand, uh, just to stand still. And the expectation is that by 2025, there'll be a, a shortfall in copper uh, 
of 13 million tons. Now that's the equivalent uh, of 25 to 30 brand new mines. Now because of the fact that we are exhausting these old um, grand mines that, we, that we've been mining for the last 20 years, the mining industry, the natural resource industry has to go to new geographies to seek new sources of supply. These are new geographies um, outside of, of the traditional North America, South Africa, Aust Australia, Chile, uh, Mongolia, Central Africa, Eastern and Central Europe, parts of Latin America that have yet to be explored. And the implications of that is there is no infrastructure, and by that I mean rail, port, and power, and roads. There is a limited skill base to, to, do these, uh, to produce these products, and there really isn't any history of large-scale mining. In fact, if you look at the projections for copper alone, by 2020, 80% um, of new copper will come from outside of the traditional producing countries. The implications of going to these countries where there is no infrastructure, there is no skill base, it's virgin territory, so to speak, is that the cost of producing these products has gone up dramatically. So the cost of building a mine, a copper mine, has gone up 23% a year for the last eight years. In fact, today, uh, the, the, the cost of new copper is double what it is to produce the existing copper. Not only is the cost of producing these commodities going up as a result, but also it's taking longer to produce these commodities. So in a study that Goldman Sachs uh, did when they looked at 200 projects that have been delayed, um, they, they saw that uh, many projects are taking us twice as long as they used to and certainly twice as long as has been projected. So the bottom line is it's getting more expensive and it's taking longer to get commodities to the customer. In that same study, Goldman Sachs identified that one of the major reasons why this delay is occurring is social factors. Now, social factors is a euphemism, really, um, for things like regulation, things like uh, environmental demands, things like community consultation, NGO activity, which is uh, becoming global and prolific, permitting delays, and so on. So these are the types of challenges that we're facing as an industry uh, as we try to bring on uh, new, new commodities and new sources of the, of the vital commodities that are required to build our economies. Now, I want to get to one of my personal uh, soapboxes here. There are a number of challenges which you'll see on that list that we face as an industry in trying to bring new commodities on board, whether it's water shortages, shortages of skills, um, the inability to get the social license to operate from, from communities and so on. But the major trend, the overarching trend, which is beginning to constrain the development of new commodities is what we call resource nationalism, another euphemism. It's, a, it's an umbrella term which covers a gamut of activities of interventions that governments tend to make. On the one hand, from uh, regulation and all, of the, all the way through taxes and royalties, and on the other hand, um, nationalization, as we've seen in, in countries like Bolivia. So... The, the reality is that governments need money. We're, we're doing fairly well because of the commodity super cycle. Uh, we're, a, we're a good target. Politically, it works well to target mining industries. We can't take our toys and go away. Um, and therefore, governments are finding it increasingly easier to exercise some form of resource nationalism, whether it's carbon taxes, which are in fact designed to help the fiscus not to reduce emissions, as, as we saw in Australia, uh, and, and other forms of uh, of uh, resource nationalism. The fact of the matter is in the long term that has the impact of slowing down supply but also causes reallocation of capital as we take our money to other countries which are more conducive. And so in practice if we're going to resolve this we have to solve this paradox. And the paradox is that the very countries or the very governments whose economies are going to be impacted negatively by the lack of supply of commodities and the high cost of commodities are the very ones who perhaps inadvertently uh, are hampering the development of these very same commodities. And how do we resolve that paradox? And the way we resolve that par paradox is by making much clearer the symbiotic relationship between the natural resource companies, the communities which are involved, and the governments. And I won't take you through all of this in great detail um, uh, at the risk of boring you, but, but I will say that mining companies make investments over 20 to 30 years. Sometimes it can take us up to 10 years before we start seeing any cash flow and 15 years before we start seeing a return. 
We require stable regulatory environments in which to make those investments. It's an absolutely essential precursor to, for us to take multi, make multi-billion dollar bets. Unfortunately, governments have forgotten that and, and have made the environment much more unstable, which makes it more difficult for us to make the very investments to produce the very commodities that are vital to their economies. And so we need to, we need to rediscover a new detente with governments, with communities, where we all understand the contributions we make respectively uh, and the benefits we gain, uh, many of which are listed on that, uh, on that slide. About two years ago, there was an iconic battle in, in Australia when they fundamentally wanted to, as you might recall, change the regime, the tax regime. Uh, we didn't object that much to the fact that they were raising taxes, although we certainly didn't like it. Uh, but we objected fundamentally to the fact, that they were, the fact that they were fundamentally changing the regime retroactively on investments that we had made 15, 20, and 30 years before that. And so Australia, which was seen as the safe haven of investment uh, for commodities, all of a sudden turned into the poster child for resource nationalism and instability. So to summarize, uh, despite the current cyclical downturn, my conviction uh, remains as strong as it was 10 years ago, which is that we are but one decade into a multi-decade secular change in the fortunes of commodities in which prices for commodities will continue to be above historical averages for the foreseeable future. Governments are inadvertently hampering the supply of the very commodities which they depend upon and we really need to move into a situation where there is a much deeper and more sophisticated symbiotic understanding of how the various parties can participate in this process. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thrice. Um, I'm probably a little bit more optimistic than Thrice uh, in terms of energy. Um, but just to get down to some basics, um, we're looking here at primary energy sources. And uh, of those, oil, coal, and gas account for about 80% of the world's current resources. Interestingly, biomass accounts for about 10%. And that's largely traditional biomass, uh, wood fuel, cow dung, and uh, agricultural wastes. So that, that features quite highly compared with uh, other renewables. Um, in terms of uses of energy, uh, the four main uses are uh, domestic uh, and other forms of heat, so commercial, retail, uh, municipal heat, industry, transportation, and electricity. And those are, account for the sort of four main areas of consumption. So where is this uh, electric oh, energy produced um, or consumed? The OECD, USA, and China uh, account for uh, more than 60% of the, uh, the, the total world energy demand. Um, you can see that the other consumers relatively are quite small. Um, I think the consumption per capita uh, chart, though, actually demonstrates the, the issues to some extent. Uh, China, India, and Africa have more than 50% of the world's population and consume less than one quarter of the OECD average per capita. Now, clearly, as those nations uh, start to increase their demand towards the OECD average, we're going to see huge increases in world energy demand. So, this table illustrates uh, where the, um, the growth is going to come. Uh, the bottom, the blue, uh, slightly purpley blue uh, chart shows that in the developed world, uh, relatively modest growth over this 25-year period, 11% um, growth in total over 25 years. It's, it's virtually static. Uh, and if we go to the top, the other countries, which are other than the developed world and the, the major consumers, again, relatively minor growth. So it's the middle band, the other major consumers, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Russia, and the Middle East. That's where we're going to see the, the huge growth in demand uh, over the next 25 years or so. And the types of energy that... Uh, are going to increase in demand. Um, 
The main areas are likely to be growth in fuels other than oil and coal. Um, we don't see much growth in oil or coal over this period. Um, the highest is what's called others here. It's the, the renewable energy sector. And I think that's driven by the demand for decarbonisation, uh, the, the reduction in greenhouse gases, and the sort of general subsidies that are coming in for renewable energies. Um, hydro has a small growth, and similarly nuclear. Um, surprisingly, gas is also growing. And I think there are three factors, three reasons for that. One is price, um, despite British Gas putting up their price again uh, today. I think um, uh, gas is still relatively uh, cheap. And as Doug will cover later, uh, the onset of fracking, um, which is a, a, one of the new technologies, is actually driving gas prices down uh, in the countries where that's happening, so particularly the United States. Um, the second area is the increase in liquefaction. Uh, liquefied gas is becoming much more readily available, and this has made gas much more transportable. So whereas previously it could only be consumed where it was produced, um, uh, other than being transported by long pipelines, now it's, it's quite a tradable commodity. Um, I think the third reason that gas is going to grow quite quickly is that it's the quickest... Uh, it's the quickest form of, certainly, electricity to produce. Uh, most other electricity technologies take maybe five, or in the case of nuclear, ten or more years to develop, whereas gas is the quick solution. And as we've seen, um, planning it doesn't seem to be one of the great strengths of uh, uh, any of the regulators or the institutions involved in, uh, in, in planning our energy need. So often we are... Uh, we do end up with the, uh, with the quick solution, which will be gas. In this table, um, I've tried to look at the depletion of resources over the 25-year period. Uh, we've got four fuels, coal, oil, gas, and nuclear. And we can see that oil and gas, actually, over a 25-year period, the current known resource is likely to be significantly depleted. Um, now, both of those, oil and gas, is showing about half the, half the current known resource being consumed over a 25-year period. Um, yes, we still have some resource left at the end of that, but it is a significant depletion. However, there are new resources coming on stream. Um, resources are estimated on the basis of current economic and uh, operating conditions, but rising prices and uh, innovative techniques make further resources viable. Um, fracking and high-cost fields could increase the gas resource by a factor of four. So instead of using half our gas resource, we might actually be down to, um, to an eighth of, of the gas resource. So actually possibly still plenty of gas around. Uh, shale oil and other non-conventional oils could more than double the current oil resources. So again, we could, be, we could have, still have three quarters of the current resource available uh, in uh, we're looking at 2035 here. Um, nuclear, although it's showing significant depletion, actually by reprocessing, I mean, at the end of a, 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 um, the nuclear cycle in the power station, there's still about 95% of the fuel energy left in the nuclear uh, product in the uranium. And by reprocessing, that can actually continue uh, almost, in, well, not indefinitely, but certainly for a much longer period. So... Um, Again, the nuclear resource is fairly extensive. And then we come to look at new technologies. I mean, the future technologies include thorium, which is uh, a technology very similar to, to the current uh, nuclear fission technology, um, could be developed within about 25 years, and has a, a much greater resource. The thorium resource, I, I believe, is, is many times that of the, current, uh, the, the uranium resource in the world. And, of course, the ultimate uh, holy grail is, uh, is fusion, which uh, is probably about 40 years off, and it has been 40 years away for probably the last 50 years. Um, but I, I do believe that we are getting slightly closer to fusion. Um, environmental considerations on extraction and consumption will probably dictate how much fossil fuel we will use in the future. So I don't believe that it's the fossil fuel resource that's going to run out. I think it's other factors. It's um, what we want to use and um, 
the, the environmental constraints on resource extraction. Uh, do, we, do we opt for fracking or, or, or do we not uh, pick that up? And on resource consumption, are we more concerned about high electricity prices or uh, are we more concerned about the environment? So I think it's those factors that uh, were driving the uh, uh, future consumption. Um, looking at oil prices, the CBR base case scenario shows oil peaking at over $200 a barrel um, around about 2020 and coming back down to about $150 a barrel. And at this level, that's enough to actually encourage development of both renewable energy and uh, bringing in new resources and, and some of the non-traditional resources. Uh, resources. Um, there is a, a, a lower case scenario, but even then that drops to about $80 a barrel. So, in summary, on the, uh, the energy side, I have to say I'm, I'm not too pessimistic. Looking at water, well, unlike energy, uh, all water is renewable. And even the consumptive uses, which are predominantly irrigation, um, that's, that's recycled through transpiration and precipitation. Uh, now, in theory, there's plenty of water around. Two-thirds of the world's energy, uh, world's surface is covered by uh, water. But uh, is there? Actually, I mean, those of you who have been caught without an umbrella today will probably think there's plenty of water around. But if we look at this rather nice chart, uh, the figure provided by USGS, um, the two-thirds of the world's water, uh, two-thirds of the world's surface covered by water is that large uh, sphere where it says all the world's water. Um, of this, about 3% is fresh water, so the smaller sphere is the fresh water. And then, if we look at the water that's available in rivers and lakes, so other than ice caps and groundwater and, and other sources that are tied up, that tiny little blip is the, uh, the fresh water that's available for use. So, really, not that much water around. Um, the analysis suggests that there's about 40 times 10 to the power of 13 cubic meters of renewable blue water each year in the world. And doing a bit of a calculation, um, for food production alone, the average requirement is about 4 cubic meters a day. World population is about 7 billion. So if all the food was irrigated, it would require about a quarter of the available water in the world. Now, that's quite significant uh, when you think of large rivers like the Amazon, where really there's not much... Uh, not, it, it's, it's not really usable uh, for irrigation. Clearly, a lot of food production is not irrigated. So what are the issues? Well, it's location of water. Um, people used to live where water was available. Uh, now some one billion people live in regions where there is insufficient water. Um, population growth, uh, probably another 1.6 billion people by 20, 2035. Urbanisation, as Thras has all already covered, um, population growing from 52% to 60%, nearly 2 billion more people in urban environments by 2035. Changing diet, um, meat production requires about 10 times as much water as is needed for, uh, for wheat or for bread. So again, a move uh, to uh, a meat-consuming diet will give a requirement for a lot more water. Climate change, uh, impact on precipitation levels, no one's quite sure, but there is a sort of general acceptance that rainfall intensity will increase. And trans transboundary issues. So, in conclusion, we think that there's plenty of water around, but there is a, a need for a lot of investment in transfer treatment and storage. So, I'll pass you back to Doug now, thanks. So we've looked at the likely constraints on world economic growth, and what we've concluded is that in some areas, these are likely to exist. The aftermath of the Western financial crisis is likely to be a constraint on growth both in the West and in the East. The Euro crisis will either constrain growth through its deflationary effects, if it stays in existence, or through its disruptive effects, if it breaks up. The environment is likely to hold back growth through rising prices, if not necessarily directly. Thras has shown very eloquently that there are likely to be shortages of minerals to support rapid growth unless government policies change. And further substantial 
investment in food and water supplies will be necessary to support even relatively modest economic growth. There will also need to be energy investment, and on pessimistic assumptions about energy supplies, and Mike's explained how uh, there could be a range of different plausible assumptions made about energy supplies, uh, we could have a high energy price. So world economic growth is forecast to average a bit above 2% on our base scenario. However, as Michael showed, there is also a more optimistic scenario, the low price scenario for energy, which would give world economic growth at 3% per annum, which is on the high side historically, and that gives some idea of what might happen if primary product price inflation can be contained. Against this background, what's the prospect for Western Europe? Our analysis indicates that growth would be sluggish, whatever the circumstances, uh, for a whole range of different reasons. But there are two new killer applications in GM food and shale gas, which Mike's already mentioned, which do have the possibility of improving the trade-off between growth and inflation, though they both create environmental issues. In the US, they have been fairly keen to develop their energy supplies dramatically, and they have been less concerned about holding them back for environmental reasons. And the blue line on this chart shows how the number of oil rigs in the US has changed in recent years. And you can see this blue line, which shows an absolutely dramatic rise, uh, particularly in the last two years. One of the consequences of that is the price gap uh, between the price of West Texas Intermediate, which is the main uh, uh, oil that's priced in the US, and the price of Brent crude. The green line at the bottom shows a historic spread between the two, with Brent, uh, uh, it's Brent minus West Texas. So uh, uh, when it goes above zero on the right-hand scale, it means that Brent is higher. And the price as of yesterday, the price gap was $20.14, which for something that for most of history, the gap has been pretty close to zero, is an indication of the benefit that the United States is now getting in terms of cheaper energy. But even more interesting than cheap oil is natural gas. Now, the price of natural gas went up by 3% this morning, um, but the figures still hold that um, natural gas, as a result of the development of shale, is actually available now uh, at the equivalent, if you were thinking of it in uh, calorific terms, at the equivalent of $24 uh, a, a barrel uh, in, in oil price terms. So with gas in the US now a quarter of the cost of oil, both these factors are already giving US businesses a significant economic advantage over European businesses. And as we've seen, GM technologies will also convey a significant cost advantage. If we fail to take advantage of these, we could be left in a position where the European economy struggles even more. So to put all this together, Worldwide, the area where the shoe is likely to pinch most is minerals. And the policies most likely to help sustain more rapid world economic growth probably need to focus there, um, policies that combine environmental efficiency with economic efficiency. In Europe, we also run the risk of being hit disproportionately if other countries take advantage of new technologies while we fail to do so ourselves. Now, my best ever economic forecasts have been proved wrong. The purpose of making economic forecasts is not to be proved right, but to find ways of improving on the worst outcome. The analysis that we've seen today looking at the environment, food, minerals, energy and water has highlighted what we need to do so as best to alleviate the constraints that otherwise would limit world economic growth. 
If we ignore these issues, the fruits of growth in increased prosperity and substantially reduced poverty will not be achieved. And if we ignore these issues in Europe, we may find ourselves at a further disadvantage. So, to conclude, the economic growth from the emerging economies is not going to be additional. It is likely to squeeze out growth in our Western economies. To some extent, it is a zero-sum game. And we are going to have to work hard in Europe if we want to be competitive in this emerging world. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much. Indeed. Andrew Ross from Global Garden. A uh, question firstly is to Thras. Is there any prospect of a reserves valuation being introduced to value the natural capital of the world, the biosphere, the forests and the ecosystems which underlie the entire global economic industrial base. Yeah. In other words, transposing reserve valuation upwards into the biosphere. Mm -hmm. And really the second question for Mike is looking at how the, uh, the bond market could begin to value that by looking at the risks that the major corporates now see in the sustainability of their supply chain. Like yes, yeah, sure, with pleasure. Um, I, I'm not aware of any moves in that direction other than in the carbon space, of course, which is, which is I think, the first uh, environment in which that would happen. Um, I have to say that, that, um, that mining companies and natural resource companies, certainly the leading ones, are, are very aware of exactly the kind of um, point you're making here. And, and in fact are making a significant contribution to things like the biosphere, to biodiversity, to restoration of, uh, of the environments in which we operate. And then that, there is a natural tension, of course, between the environment and, and, and what we do to supply these vital commodities. But I think for the first time in this decade, uh, and I've been in, involved in some form in mining over uh, nearly three decades now, I, I, I can say comfortably for the first time in this decade, I think mining companies together with the communities in which they operate, um, and I'm not going to add governments necessarily to that because I think governments have a different agenda by and large, but with communities with, in which they operate, uh, are beginning to make those trade-offs much more actively and much more clearly. And it is possible that you, you know, we'll get to a point where we can try and put some kind of price on it so that the trade-offs are made much more directly and more clearly. Um, and, and as I said, it's beginning to happen in the, in the carbon space. Uh, I, I will add a footnote to that, which is that I'm afraid governments, and you probably know this, um, like these trends, and so carbon is the next trend where they can, they can bolster their fiscus without necessarily thinking about um, either the positive or negative impacts of that. So I, I'm, not, um, I'm not fully confident in, in, the, in the agenda behind the carbon taxes and, and, and carbon, but, but I have to say that that is one way to price the externalities into, into how we go about our business to make sure that the right balance is struck uh, between the supply of commodities and, and the impact it has on the environment. Mike. Um, right, Andrew. Um, bonds, yes, that's, that's quite an innovative concept. Um, sorry, the, the, um, the price of carbon is obviously priced into the economic analysis of power projects quite generally, and has been for a while. And obviously with uh, Kyoto, with uh, emission reduction units and carbon credits, there are mechanisms for bringing the costs of carbon and emissions in, into uh, the costs of electricity production. Um, but in terms of using bonds, I think this is quite an innovative concept. And it would seem to me that the bondholders would have to effectively buy emission reduction units um, through subscribing to these bonds. Um, so as I said, I don't think it's happened yet, but uh, clearly you're working on that. Rowena, next question. Um, right after. Question for Michael. You'll be um, That's, yeah. Rowena Paxton. Uh, Michael, you mentioned two sort of other sources of potential 
um, energy fusion and was it thrum I couldn't thorium thorium could you tell me what do you mean by those two okay um, the the current nuclear uh, generation is by fission it's by um, splitting atoms uh, so and, and releasing energy that way but fusion is is the mechanism that works in the Sun it's um, hydrogen being two hydrogen atoms being combined to make helium, H2HE. And that is a, a non-proliferating, well, I suppose the sun carries on going for quite a while, but uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't suffer from proliferation. The only problem with it is that you need to confine the hydrogen atoms in a very small space, apply a lot of pressure. And currently, it's a reaction that they're managing to, uh, they're, they're managing to get it happening but currently it consumes more energy than it produces. I think there may have been one uh, experiment where a little bit more energy came out than was put in, but obviously using more energy than you produce is not a great uh, way of producing electricity. Um, it has traditionally, everyone said it's been 14 year, 40 years away, and it probably is still the best part of 40 years away before we get there. Thorium is a process, it's a fission process, and it's virtually identical to the current process that we have but it uses a different source of fuel. It's, again, it's, um, it can't be used for weapons. Um, it's a breathing reaction, which means that it goes on and on. So once you start the reaction, it carries on going until the fuel is virtually used up. So it, um, a, a kilo, kilogram of thorium will give you much, much more energy than a, a kilogram of uranium put through a single cycle. Okay. Nigel, do you want to comment on that? You're an energy expert. That, okay, right. Gentlemen at the back, you had a, a question, sir. Um, my name's Nigel White, representing myself, though I also am a pension fund trustee. Um, question is about commodities. Um, with energy, we talked about depletion of certain sources of energy. Is it likely, within the foreseeable future, that certain commodities, notwithstanding the difficulty in extracting, will simply become depleted? Uh, and if so, what scope is there for recycling commodities to solve that, or is that not really ever going to meet ongoing demand. Thras, I think that's a question for you. Yes, I mean, there are two aspects to that question. And um, the first thing I would say is that I'm not one of the subscribers to the sort of peak, peak oil argument in the area of commodities. I think that there are vast tracts of the world which have been unexplored, uh, which, in which most of the commodities we depend upon exist. And so I think my short answer would be we don't see depletion as the issue here, simply the ability to supply uh, in enough volume and, and quickly enough. On the recycling side, uh, there is increasingly a move towards, uh, towards exploiting existing commodities that are already out there. And in fact, in many commodity spaces, recycled commodities make up a big proportion of, uh, of the, the final product that's produced. In stainless steel, uh, it's now close to 50% of stainless steel that's produced is made up of recycled stainless steel. Uh, the same is not, not in high, as high a proportion, but certainly copper is recycled significantly. And platinum, of course has a significant recycled component to it. So recycling is a growing trend as, as product stewardship through the life cycle becomes a bigger issue. Uh, and I think you'll see that grow as time goes on. Now, one of the things I would say uh, that has impacted the level of recycling in the world is, of course, the fact that this new infrastructure is being built in countries where there is no pre-existing infrastructure. And, and the, the recycling cycle uh, is itself a 15 to 25 year cycle. So in other words, if you, if you build a plant made out of steel, you will only get that steel back to recycle 20 years later. And so if you consider that China and India are only now building their plants, they don't have uh, existing plants. And so for a period of time until their infrastructure gets to a mature point, the percentage of recycled product as a, as a total will be lower than it has been historically. Thanks very much. Next question. Sir. I wonder, Doug, part of the thesis of this seems to me that the emerging economies have an advantage because they've grown so quickly they haven't adapted socially, so to speak. Is that likely to cause a fraction in its own right? Are they likely to have social unrest, even rebellion, which could cause them to stagnate more quickly as well? Carl, if I, if I was going to be badly behaved, I'd say I'm covering this topic in a lot more detail at one of the future lectures. But let me just sub down very quickly what I plan to say there. Uh, I don't want to discourage you from coming along because there'll be a lot more detail then. Um, I think the answer is that there is a tension between um, the way uh, at which these countries, the pace at which these countries have developed and the sort of social demands that people typically make. 
Um, and we've seen this. Uh, we, we, we've seen tensions overflowing in, in a variety of countries. I think perhaps the most obvious place is Thailand, where uh, uh, um, the system has, had, uh, uh, has exploded fairly dramatically uh, in the not very distant past. So, yes, I think there is a tension. Um, and to some extent, I think people will want to sort of cushion the hard edge of economic progress. But my guess is that two things will constrain the pace at which they cushion this hard edge. The first of those is they will see that in the West, we've probably gone too far. And we've put ourselves into a, a situation where we're almost creating economic mi misery, uh, particularly with some of our welfare systems, which are now creating quite considerable disincentives for people to work. Now, people in the East can see this. I was in Hong Kong two weeks ago, and a lot of the discussions I had were on the effects of introducing a welfare system, which they think they're likely to do there, and how to do so without reducing the incentive to work. So I think there is a consciousness that elsewhere, people have done things that haven't been entirely helpful to their own economies, and some desire not to replicate the mistakes, not to make the same mistakes that we have made. You tend to know, if you do something second, you can learn from the guys who did it first, and you can try and see what mistakes they made. I think the second thing is that there is a lot of momentum associated with the current drive towards economic prosperity in the East. And people have seen a formula that they feel has worked. And I think because they can see a formula that they feel has worked, they're probably slightly less willing to change it than they might be if they got rich more gradually. It's a little bit like, you know, when you... Uh, boil the frog. Supposedly, if you raise the temperature very gradually, you kill the frog without it noticing. Um, well, slightly in the same way in the West, we've sort of taken on costs and things like that without fully appreciating the scale that we've taken on and without fully understanding all the assumptions that we've made that built that in. In the East, because growth's been a bit more rapid, uh, they, can see, uh, the, they can see the system, you know, what has driven the prosperity, and they're still pretty keen about it. I go to the East quite often, and um, one of the things I note is they don't take growth for granted in a way that we do. And the funny thing is, because they don't take growth for granted, it probably is pretty assured. Whereas because we, don't take it for, uh, because we do take it for granted, we may well find we don't have it. Next question. Sir. Uh, Fazal Kunka from the PNJ Network in Milton Keynes. Uh, I have a question actually for Professor Williams. Um, I think uh, I remember in your last lecture you talked about the GDP of India overtaking China yep. by 2050. Did you mean also the per capita income or just the gross uh, domestic product? No, um, one of the things I said was that one of the reasons that I thought that India would overtake China was because the population would be between 40 and 50 percent larger, yes. the population of India, by the year 2050. And those trends are largely set. I mean, it's true that there will be some people in both countries who haven't been born yet, but um, it takes a long time to reverse a population policy. And so it's pretty certain that uh, GDP, it, 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 that one of the driving factors in India will be a high population, which will promote growth in two different ways. The first is that people tend on balance to be positive for GDP growth, although not necessarily for GDP per capita. Uh, but the second is that you get a distributional effect, which is that you tend to have um, a bigger surplus of profits in a fast, with, when you've got a surplus of labor, effectively. You have higher profits in those circumstances. And given that profits tend to be reinvested to a greater extent than wages which tend to be consumed, what happens is that you have a greater investment ratio in a country with a faster population growth. And because you have a greater investment ratio in a country with a faster population growth, what tends to happen is that that investment itself boosts economic growth. So the per capita income will also... It, well, it won't be... Not, not, not in the current century. I'd no. be surprised if it overtakes. Yes. Um, I was talking simply about GDP, not GDP per capita. Okay, thank you. Next question. Goodness. Well, have the last question, sir. I do see that uh, the clock has just hit seven o'clock, and um, so we're about to turn into a pub. Okay. Uh, Stefan Del Marco. Um, so over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of consolidation in the mining industry into these mega mining houses, these conglomerates. 
Uh, my question is for Thras uh, to comment on whether that's improved the relationships you have with the government or had the reverse effect. Um, I think that that's an interesting question. I think there are a number of factors at play. The first thing that I would say is that the global diversified model um, has enabled us to have a different negotiating position with governments than uh, if we were a single country mining company. So in other words, we have more optionality to re-divert our, re our investments to other countries if governments get to a point where we're making it too uncomfortable for us to invest. That by definition gives us a different seat at the table uh, when we have those discussions. However, the other thing I would say is that the global diversified mining companies, um, BHP, uh, Rio Tinto, our, ourselves, um, Anglo-American, uh, have a much more sophisticated view today of how, uh, what our role in society is, uh, what the trade-offs are between what we do and, and the impacts we have on, for example, the environment or the community. And I think that we are uh, honestly and actively trying to create a different nature of relationship, as I was saying in my presentation, between ourselves and governments, between ourselves and the very communities in which, on which we depend. And I think that's a very positive thing. Uh, and so it's not necessarily a result of being diversified, but it's a result of understanding what makes us sustainable as a business. And I think there's a much more sophisticated view of that today than there's ever been. Thank you very much. Susan, I hadn't noticed you were here when I uh, made my joke about actuaries being financial weapons of mass destruction, but do you want to defend your profession quickly before, uh, uh, before we end the session? Uh, a lot of actuarial valuations now increasingly are based on <coughs> bonds, as you say. Um, we've tended to use AA corporate bonds. They have come down enormously um, compared to subprime loans that you're talking about. So we have seen massive increased liabilities on pension schemes, which, driven by their investment largely in equities still in the UK, is, has had massive impacts on you know, um, companies with final salary pension schemes. Which is one of the I, reasons they've shut them down. W which is why, yeah, there's very, very few open final salary pension schemes now, I think, in the UK. Um, and each year that goes by, you still see more bad news coming through. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but bonds now are historically low, and certainly gilts. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We refer more to gilts now, and they're the lowest they've been for 90, 100 years. Well, my thesis is we're going to have low interest rates for a very, 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 very long time. It is looking like that. And we like need that. to adjust yeah. ourselves to that expectation. And we need to adjust what we do. And one of the problems when you move into a new situation is that if your thinking is too heavily conditioned by the past, you can make investing mistakes. And those are the sorts of things that lead to the economic disruption that I was talking about. But uh, I hadn't realised you were present when I made the joke about actuaries. Uh, so please excuse me in the circumstances. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you all very much for attending. Can I thank Thras and Mike in particular for giving such eloquent views of what's going on in the minerals and energy and water section. Uh, can I thank you very much for braving the elements. I'm afraid there are no free drinks this evening. Um, I didn't want to tell you this beforehand in case I lost a complete audience. So can I apologize for that? Um, free drinks tend to be associated with inaugural lectures, I'm afraid. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the case. But we're going to hang around for a few minutes afterwards. So if there are any questions or issues that you want to raise, uh, please do so. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thanks. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk